I'm continuing my series on the Candidates Tournament 2024 that starts on the 3rd of April. It's the opening ceremony on the 3rd of April and finishes on the 22nd of April, played in Toronto. Eight players slugging it out for the chance to meet Ding Liren for the World Championship title. Candidates Tournament, always one of my favourite events because it's so well fought. You know, they're playing for a big prize. Double round all play all. Now, so far I've looked at Furious Ja, I've looked at Gukesh, and today I'm looking at the play of Nijat Abasov. Now, Abasov, 28 years old, from Azerbaijan, he's clearly the weakest player in the tournament. He qualified through the World Cup last year. He had an incredible run in the World Cup. He defeated uh, Giri. He defeated um, Svidler, Salem Saleh, Vidit, uh, before uh, being dispatched in the semi-final by Magnus Carlsen. But I think, although Abasov is the weakest in the tournament... I think he could play a very significant role because of his style. He's someone that hits out. He's not afraid to attack by any means. Have a look at this game. So this was from the World Cup last uh, August where he qualified. So a bass of white against Geary. And this was actually one of their rapid tiebreak games. So it's a pretty standard isolated queen's pawn position. The knight very well placed on the outpost and the other pieces pretty normally placed. Geary has nice knights here that cover the d5 square and the next thing is he needs to bring his queen's bishop into play and once it reaches the long diagonal, let's say b6 and bishop b7 or bishop d7 and, and bishop c6, then usually black is fine in these kind of positions. So what did Abasov do here? h4. Okay, it's already it's a bit wacky. So bishop d7 from Giri. g4. Wow. Now, that really set the cat amongst the pigeons. Not that this is better for white, but it gave Abasov the initiative and, well, there were lots of ups and downs in this game, but uh, he finally punched through in an end game. But basically, he was on the attack from the word go. So, very interesting style. And I'd like to show you his game against Fabiano Caruana. Now, this was for the third place playoff in the World Cup. So they both got knocked out in the semi-final, but they're playing for third and fourth position. And it's a classical game. So Abasov with white and Caruana plays solidly like this. And this can go into, let's say, a queen's gambit. But Abasov plays the Catalan with white. Very sound opening. Bishop comes to the long diagonal, both sides castle. And now Caruana takes on c4. Queen's d2, so Abasso is going to collect the pawn, and a6. So this is the absolute main line of the Catalan, and the idea is that after Queen takes pawn, the pawn comes to b5, the Queen goes back, and then Bishop b7, the Bishop reaches the long diagonal to match that very important Bishop on g2. And then Black hits out by playing Knight d7, and then c5, that's... The basic idea. Abasov played a4 just to contain black. So again one of the absolute main lines of this opening. Uh, there is a slight drawback with this move. Um, it looks looks reasonable to you know bottle black in a little bit but it does weaken the b4 square. So it's nice to claim some space however there is a drawback. Bishop d7, this is the problem piece for black in the Catalan. So this one needs to match the bishop on the long diagonal. Queen c4, recovers the pawn, 
bishop c6. Very good. There is a slight problem with having the bishop on c6. It blocks the c pawn, and normally that's where black gets counterplay with pawn to c5. So you can see that in all these variations, there are there are pros and cons to how you play. Ninety seven, but you know black's development is very normal, very natural, and very harmonious actually. But black lacks a little bit of space here. That's the only drawback. Knight c3. Yep, got to bring the knight out. h6, putting the question to the bishop. Standard move is bishop takes knight. But Abasov drops back to f4. Bishop d6. So why is bishop d6 played? Well, it's of course, it's it can be nice to exchange off the bishops. But it's more about giving that queen a square off the back rank to connect the rooks. So it's well motivated. And of course, if this is exchanged, then black is very comfortable. You know, there's just one open file. The queen will have to go back. Looks looks quite comfortable for, for black. So queen d3. Yeah, the queen a little bit exposed on c4, but also you might want to support the e4 advance. And there are there are lots of ways to play this. I mean, one sensible way is to play queen e7 and then to go with e5. Challenging white center looks very reasonable. You could also play a5, a very standard move in these kind of positions, because very often a knight will leap round via b6, d5, and into b4. Very standard idea. But Caruana exchanged on f4. You know, there are pros and cons to all these moves. Um, you know, in the long term, it could be useful for black that white's kingside pawn structure is just a little bit damaged, but white can also turn this in his favour as well. a5 from Caruana, claiming the b4 square. And from a position which looks like a, a positional struggle, Abasov spies his chance. The semi-open g-file. King h1. Obviously looking to put the rook on g1 opposite the king, which doesn't look bad, particularly as that pawn is on h6. With the pawn on h7, then black can solidly put a blocker on g6 and it's supported by h7 and f7 then that's pretty secure with the pawn on h6 you can see that that really leaves both these pawns feeling a bit vulnerable you know fairly easy to, to sack a piece on g6 for example so that's why i think king h1 certainly in this position is quite well well motivated not that I think black is particularly worse here. Caruana exchanges on f3, so why has he done that? Well, it's about freeing his position a little bit. That exchange certainly gives black a little bit more room. You never know, the queen might pop out here. This bishop, of course it's quite a nice piece, but is blocked by that pawn. So Abasov continues with his plan, rook g1. So the king steps in the corner, and I mean that's preempting white doubling on the g-file, and the rook will simply slide across to protect the pawn on g7. That's not going to be enough for white to actually force a breakthrough. So Abasov shoves the e-pawn forward. Queen e7. Yeah, connecting the rooks, rook g3 and rook d8. So there is a drawback to playing e4. Yes, it's nice to push this and push the knight out of the way potentially. But in playing that pawn forward, it's actually weakened the pawn on d4. So e4 is really uncompromising. You know, if I go back a couple of moves, I would much rather have this pawn formation. But then again, it'll just be more difficult for white to attack on the king side because, as I said, the doubling of rooks doesn't achieve much on its own. 
So e4 is very ambitious and actually quite double-edged because it does weaken this pawn. Queen e7, rook g3, rook d8, rook g1, doubling on the g-file, but rook g8 defends solidly. And Abasov makes use of this e-pawn to push the f6 knight out of the way. So he's gained territory. If something like knight d5, that can be exchanged, and f5, and white is very much in business there. That looks fantastic. But knight h7, not a beautiful square for the knight. You know, where is it going next? However, it could be useful in protecting the king. And in the meantime, there could be some counterplay on d4. You know, if this knight moves out of the way in queen b4, then all these pawns are a little bit vulnerable. Queen e3, the queen steps out of the d file, very sensible. If, well, for example, in this position, I would very much like to play f5 here. But then knight takes e5, and that pin is very unfortunate for white. So queen e3. Knight b6. Okay, seems reasonable. Unmasking the rook, looking at this pawn. Bishop e4. Okay, so this bishop, which wasn't, well, is rather blunted on this diagonal, turn, turns towards the king side, and that's getting more dangerous. Caruana played queen b4. He must have overlooked something in his calculations. Um, it's just a big mistake. In fact, black is still okay here if f5 is played and if that's exchanged. Well, the e-pawn isn't very beautiful, but look at white's pawns here. You know, they're rather shattered. And actually, black is, is still okay here. In, in advancing the f-pawn, you can see that the queen now connects with the king side, so black is actually more secure. Black is all right there. But queen b4 is a massive mistake. Watch what happens. Bishop takes knight, exchanging off that knight, which might at first glance look a little bit odd, but actually watch what happens. Knight e4. So once this knight cruises over, then black is in massive trouble. If queen takes... Okay, how do we deal with that one? Okay, I'll tell you what, I'll let you have a go. White to play and win. How are you going to deal with that one? White to play and win, hopefully not too difficult. Are you ready? Knight g5. King steps back, knight takes f7 with a nice fork. And pawn takes, check, mate. There we are. Dead easy. So Caruana brought the queen back to e7, but after f5, he resigned. Just like that, 26 moves, game over. So why did Caruana resign? Okay, let's have a look at knight d5. Let's, let's discover what the threat is. Well, here's the threat. And then f6. And you take the queen. There we go. No time to snaffle that one. And after pawn takes. Okay, over to you again. White to play. How are you going to deal with this one? White to play. You might well have seen this already. You might be able to work it out just from this position. Knight f6 is an absolute killer. King goes back. Let's do that one. And mate on g8. On the next turn, let's just put the final position there. Good. And if pawn takes, here we go. Queen sack time. Yes. The laser beam checkmate. Beautiful stuff. I've had the joy of getting that one in one of my games at top level. 
and uh, that was very very satisfying I have to say so there we go f5 that was the final move Caruana resigned well what a tour de force from Abasov but you can see you know his instinct is to attack of course when you're playing the world's top players then you know you you, you can't always do this but given a chance, he might be in. And that's why, although he's by far the weakest player in the tournament, he could have an influence on the standings because he can take out anyone, as we've seen, you know, defeating Fabiano Caruana, really one of the best in the world. So there we go. I'm very much looking forward to the candidates tournament starting at the beginning of April, and there'll be more preview videos coming your way. Thanks for watching.